Hello and welcome to Winter Wildfowl. Incoming flocks of winter wildfowl are one of the greatest wildlife spectacles of the winter months. We get a lot of birds coming in, to, migrating in to overwinter in Britain and Shropshire is a fabulous place to see some of them. We've got some really good wetland sites. This just shows where a few of them are. Um, the Ellesmere group of mirrors up there um, in the north west of the county where I come from, but lots of other good lakes roundabout that you get some really interesting birds turning up. So I'm just going to look through what sort of things you might expect to see in Shropshire. Um, these are some hooper swans. Um, they're totally unlike our native, uh, the breeding population of mute swans we have here. Hooper swans are the true wild swans. One of two sorts of tundra swans we get calling in at Shropshire. Hooper swans are the more usual ones. Um, many of them make the journey from Iceland in a single 600 800 mile flight in one night. They've been seen at high altitudes, but usually fl fly quite low. And quite often you'll see them on the lakes in the morning, um, looking completely exhausted. I can remember watching a small party of them on the mirror at Ellesmere, um, and they spent all morning sleeping. Um, I was waiting for them to put their heads up so I could make sure that they really were Uber swans, but I had to wait until lunchtime. Um, they were obviously completely knackered. From their, from their long flight. They travel in family parties. Um, quite interesting, really. There's a, a, a lovely story from the Mir. Um, a party of five arrived, um, migrating south, and they use it as a sort of motorway service station. They stop off for a little while, and then they move on. Um, four of them moved on, and one was left behind. And this solitary Hooper swan she was trying to make friends with the mute swans, which weren't very interested, and looking very sad and lonely. And about three days later, the party came back and reunited with their lost member. And there was tremendous, you can almost say rejoicing in the birds. You could see how pleased they were to see each other. Some swimming here, they have very nicely marked beaks which allows um, people who study them to recognize individuals so their beaks are almost like a fingerprint you can tell which exactly which goose uh, which one you're looking at this shows um, where birds ringed in this country subsequently end up and almost all of them are icelandic this one's a Buick swan, and they have slightly less yellow on their beak, and they're a much daintier bird, they're a lot smaller, so, which is easy to recognise if you've got the two together, but not so easy, obviously, if, if you've got one Buick in on its own, but the, the beak marking will tell you. Don't show up quite so often, and that's just the difference between the two species. Hooper swans, as I said, mostly from, from Iceland. Buick swans coming from further east and flying down across Scandinavia, not coming across the north of Britain so much. And just for comparison, these are our native um, resident mute swans. <clears throat> They're a much bigger, heavier bird. They're our heaviest British flying bird, apart from the, uh, the few great bustards which are being reintroduced down at Salisbury Plain, but we don't see those up here, so really an unmistakable bird. Going on to the geese, is a grey lag goose is the, the usual one you'll see. Um, very much um, hunted out really by wildfowlers, and we did end up with only, the only population really of grey lags was um, up in the north of Scotland, 
but they were reintroduced. They're also the ancestral bird for the, for the farmyard geese. So you really do have to watch out when you're observing these birds at places like the Mere in Ellesmere, um, because there are quite a few feral uh, farmyard geese there as well. They do interbreed with other geese, so um, particularly places that there are a lot of wildfowl uh, and, and a lot of people around, like, like the Mere in Ellesmere, you get crossbred geese. And I was forever having people coming in and seeing they'd seen whatever exotic species. And it was actually a crossbred farmyard Canada or something like that. So that's one to watch out for. They're, um, they're sort of the standard goose, but um, not likely to be a wild population. You do occasionally get them coming in in groups uh, from the north, but the resident ones are usually fairly mixed. <clears throat> the other two grey geese, the pink-footed geese and the white-fronted geese, don't breed in this country at all. Um, a lot of them overwinter here. They come from Spitsbergen, Iceland, Greenland, and um, they like particularly places with good grazing. There's a lot of them migrating down to Norfolk, but we do get odd ones not tend not to get the big flocks in Shropshire, but certainly odd ones will turn up. And we do get regular oddities, if you like, like this tundra bean goose. It's much browner than the, the grey the grey geese. Um, breeds 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 on the Russian tundra. Um, again, it eats odd ones, so. There's also a tiger bean goose, which is a bit bigger and has more orange on its beak. But this is the one we usually find in Shropshire. But they're occasional visitors. But that's one of the excitements about watching the mirrors and watching the lakes, is that you never quite know what's going to turn up. All sorts of odd things pop up um, and surprise the regular watchers. The barnacle geese, we don't get here very often, but odd ones do appear. This one, this one's on the mere in Ellesmere. Most of them winter further north. Um, they're quite a small goose, and you can tell it's not a Canada goose because there's no brown on it. It's got a lot more white on its face. They always look very cleanly marked, rather neat little geese. Most of them you'll find wintering places like Calaverock on the Solowy coast, uh, Martin Mere, just a bit further north than here. Um, they nest in Greenland, Svalbard, that sort of place. Always worth watching out for though, they're very tidy looking goose, absolutely lovely. Now I've put this one in, this one is, you. I mean the ones we get in this country tend to be escapes. Um, a lot of them are kept in wildfowl collections, they do escape quite readily. So this bar-headed goose, you might, might pop up, but it's, it's quite an interesting one. This is, breeds in Central Asia and migrates to India and Burma, which takes it across the Himalayas. So these geese have been seen at really high altitudes. They've been tracked at 7,270 metres up and anecdotal evidence from climbers say they've seen them actually flying over Everest so that's more than 8,000 feet up absolutely incredible things but in this country like I say just mainly escapes cormorants are quite a common sight um, there are resident ones we get them year round on the lakes and meers um, but they're greatly increased by birds coming in from the coast when the weather gets a bit rough there. So it's worth watching out. If there's been a good storm um, in Shropshire, usually from the, it be from the west or northwest, it'll drive these seabirds inland. And it's not just the cormorants that come, there's all sorts of sea ducks that we get as well. The cormorant you can recognise because it, it swims very low in the water and it, you can usually see the white yellow patch on its beak 
and basically acts quite differently from a duck. So you'll definitely know it's a cormorant. They do this wonderful sort of spread eagle stance when they're drying their wings. Um, they can actually be quite destructive to trees because they tend to roost in, in big mobs and their, um, their droppings can, can cause quite a lot of trouble with the trees. They can actually um, smother the trees completely. This is another uh, fish eater, like the cormorant is. This is goosanders, and they're not true migrants. So it used to be that we didn't see them in Shropshire. Um, until about 1950, they were all much further north, but they colonised. Uh, in the winter time, we see many more of them on the lakes and meres, and, and their breeding territories are usually on rivers. Um, you see them on the Severn quite a lot, often with very large parties of, um, of ducklings, great long strings of ducklings behind them. But in the winter, they prefer the more the shelter of the, the and the safety of the lakes. So the males, obviously, handsome bird with the dark green head, and the females with with a, a, a red head. But without the tuftiness, you get with the mergansers, which we'll look at next. Cusanders are um, fish eaters, they're saw bills, so their bills actually have a tooth edge for catching fish and they're quite hefty predators on fish. In some rivers it's been recorded that 80% of their food is young salmon and trout, which makes them quite unpopular with the anglers. A baby goosander, a young goosander, is going to take 72 pounds of fish to get to adult weight. So it's quite a lot of fish. Um, they will also hunters' packs, which is a wonderful thing to see. They have, um, I've, I've seen them on the Muir in Ellesmere, herding small fish, um, little groups of fry, into one of the old boat houses. And they then took turns a group of maybe eight or ten of them, and they would take turns in swimming into the boathouse and picking out the fish. And then they'd come out and the next one would go in. So, very interesting behaviour and quite um, heavy predation on the, on the fish. One spectacularly lovely birds, though. Really, really beautiful um, markings. These are the red-breasted magansas, which are quite similarly designed, they're quite closely related. Um, obviously the difference is that they, they have the red breasts and they also have rather tufty, um, tufty feathers on their heads. Um, uncommon inland, usually seen on the coast, but worth watching out for. Like I say, these things do pop up in Shropshire. And the last of the sawbills, these are smew which are absolutely beautiful little ducks. Very compact, neat little ducks, quite short beaks, and this, the males having this wonderful black and white plumage. And we do get, they get usually on the sea, but we get them regularly in places like um, Whitemere, up in the Ellesmere group of mares. Um, well worth watching out for them. They, 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 every, every winter we seem to get two or three maybe come along and I've seen them Colmere and Whitemere but uh, it's worth looking um, at other wetland sites through the county for them. Back to the um, dabbling ducks and diving ducks, the golden eye is a diver and they're really rather spectacular. They have, the, the males have this wonderful green head with a big white patch on, so you can quite easily spot that it's a golden eye. Um, most of the ones in Britain come here from um, central, northern, eastern Europe. Um, as there, are, there, are, there is a breeding population of them, but only in um, up in Scotland. They're tree nesters and the provision of nest boxes for them has, has encouraged them to stay. 
because like, obviously it's, it's quite a large bird for a tree for for a hole nester. They need quite a big hole in a tree, and the trees need to be really big and old to have that capacity for them. But they will readily take to nest boxes. One of the one of the interesting things about them is that they're one of the few that pair up. For, they do their choose their mates during the winter before they've returned to their breeding grounds. And these ones are going back to Scandinavia and Finland, but as because they're caught here, they might meet up with a duck from um, a completely different region from where they were born. And so you get the populations dispersing quite easily. And in the winter you'll see them doing their, doing their courtship displays and the male do this wonderful head back thing and then they kick their back feet up and make a, an absolutely fantastic noise. They uh, uh, sort of describe as a rasping double whistle, which is a, is a rather a burbling call almost. It, it, you can hear it a kilo, about a kilometre away, it's really loud. Um, and this is to attract the, the females. Who then, when they, they, they don't breed here, as I say, they return to their breeding ground ready paired up, ready to go. And uh, this, is, this is their migration paths. Mallards are standard ducks, if you like. They're the one that we see on all the ponds, um, anywhere that people go and feed birds, feed the wildfowl, there'll be mallards there. But there'll be lots, lots more in the winter. So we have our breeding population of them, but they're added to by good numbers of, um, of, of mallards from northeast Europe. Um, does it, it's easy to dismiss these as, well, this is, you know, it's just a mallard, you know. They're actually quite incredible. They're, they're very fast. They can fly at nearly 50 miles an hour when they're migrating in, 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 in steady flight and, and, and do long distances. Um, they're the only duck that quacks, so if it quacks, it's a mallard. Um, spectacular coloured plumage on the wing and those lovely little curly, curly tails. And they're the ancestor of most of our farmyard ducks. So again, places that there are a lot of ducks about, people might have dumped farmyard birds, um, you get crossbred ones as well. Ducks and geese are notoriously unfussy. And you get you do get hybrids which look similar to their parents but a bit weird or sometimes quite different. <clears throat> Teal are another one that we have a resident population breeding here. They tend to be more visible in the winter. Um, quite a lot of the ones that breed here will go further south for their winter and birds from further north will come in and replace them. Then they can be quite secretive but um, form small groups and you can spot them places like Wood Lane are good for seeing them. Um, really rather nice little ducks. So they, they're known to the wildfowlers as half a duck because they really are small compact beasts. Gadwall a rather plain looking duck you would think but actually when you look at one carefully the plumage has a lovely barring to it they're really like they've been quite carefully designed and really rather charming little things um, a bit smaller than a mallard and they breed in northern areas of Europe and Asia and in Central North America but ours are coming coming from from northern Europe they do nest in this country in low numbers but um, over winter, about 25,000 gadwall, which is 20 to 30 percent of the whole European population, come and winter in Britain. Uh, they like the gravel pits, the reservoirs, large lakes, quite deep water, and will also be found on coastal areas. Um, they're an amber listed species in, in Britain, 
but least concern globally. But in Britain, because we have such a big population coming in the winter, they are protected. Here's shovelers. These are rather fine looking birds. You might, at first glance, you think, oh, mallard, green head, you know. But quite often you see them in the water, they look quite different. I always think they look rather like a floating cottage loaf. They have this wonderful broad beak, broad spatulate bill, which has sort of fringes along the edges. So they feed by dabbling their beaks in the water and the fringes help them trap little invertebrates, little bits of pondweed, this sort of thing. Um, they almost comb it out. They do breed in southern and eastern England, but the birds we see here in Shropshire will be probably from Scotland and, and, and further north. Um, Northwest Europe. Quite a spectacular looking thing though, and, and wonderful to watch them doing their, doing their dabbling and fiddling about on the surface of the water. And they, this shows them migrating really from uh, sort of northeast Europe, Poland, and these sort of places. The ones in this country will migrate further south. Potchards are rather spectacular. We get a few of those on the mere, rather, rather, rather handsome birds. They're one that does hybridise quite, quite readily. Um, so you get some odd-looking ones too. Most of the ones here come from central, northern, eastern Europe, as far away as the Urals. Um, so they've had quite, quite a long journey to get here. They, they're not one that comes from Scandinavia, so they have a slightly different flight route to the, to the others. Um, small resident population of them, and they'd be joined by about 60,000 migrants in the, in, for the winter. And here they are coming from um, sort of northeast Europe. Most of these ducks you'll see in small numbers. So it'd be two, three, four together, this sort of thing. Widgeon are spectacular because they come in big, big flocks. And absolutely beautiful to see them flying. They have a lovely whistling call. Really quite delightful birds. They, they do um, congregate on places, places like um, the Mere at Ellesmere and you'll see the top of the water almost thick with them. Um, they, like, they, they need grassland to feed, they're a grazer, so anywhere there's good flood meadows and um, flooded gravel pits and reservoirs with gently sloping sides so it's easy for them to, to get in and out and grassy banks. Um, usually <coughs> stay in fairly close-knit groups and fly in tight formation so you'll see these wonderful um, wonderful flocks of them all swirling around um, beautifully coloured things and um, do listen out for them because they do sound particularly good. They breed across northern Europe, um, southern Scandinavia, and almost half of the European population of them, which is around 400,000 birds, overwinter in this country. So it's a, one of the ducks you've got a very good chance of seeing here. This is where um, Birds, birds that have been ringed in England have been recovered abroad. Um, that's the, the purple dots. The yellow dots show where birds ringed, uh, <coughs> excuse me, ringing locations of birds that were subsequently found in the UK. So quite a widespread area that they're coming from. Shell ducks are rather spectacular. These are, they, they do breed in this country and a um, very handsome duck. They're almost the size of a goose, they're a large duck, and they have this spectacular broad band of chestnut around their, around their chest. The male and the female in this species 
are the same, which is unusual in a duck. Mostly females have the drab brown cryptic coloration because when they're nesting, they want to stay hidden. Shell ducks are burrow nesters, and they'll quite often take over um, old rabbit burrows, this sort of thing. And we get them breeding at Wood Lane. It's worth going there in the spring and having a look. They have charming little black and white stripy sort of goslings, ducklings, sorry, and um, the handsome male and female, in, in, both in their green and black and white and chestnut plumage. Absolutely lovely things. Um, we get winter visitors joining our, our residence, and they're coming from Scandinavia, Poland, Baltic, these sort of areas. So more of them see in winter, but always worth having a look out for them nesting. This is one of my favourites. I absolutely love pintails. They're really elegant duck. They've got the slightly longer neck and the long tail. They, look, they could have been designed by a graphic artist, really. <coughs> then, <coughs> they're quite uncommon. Um, they rarely breed in Britain around 30 pairs breeding in Britain, Britain, Britain every year, um, mainly seen during the winter in fairly small numbers. But you can spot them, they will turn up periodically, just about anywhere else you see, you regularly see ducks. Um, quite often on the coast and estuaries, but they will be driven inland by bad weather. I was particularly thrilled when I was doing a win winter wildfowl watch at, at Ellesmere and I thought, oh, it's all a bit dull, there's some widgeon over there and there's a couple of potshards and it's a... And as I was watching, a whole flock of pintails arrived, looking absolutely pristine, beautiful, lovely marks, absolutely brilliant and just such a nice bird to see. This one really is an occasional visitor. This is a long-tailed duck and they're mostly a sea duck. So they're one of these ones that are going to be driven in by bad weather on the coast, but regularly pop up wetlands around, around Shropshire, usually in twos and threes, and very distinctive, you can't mistake them. They have a distinctive call and well worth watching out for. Tufted ducks, Again, they breed here, but they're added to by large numbers coming from abroad. Um, a lot of them are Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and they're rather a compact little duck, and they have that lovely white patch on them and the tuft on the back of the head. Really, totally unmistakable. The beak has a lovely blue colour and a black tip to it. So the only one you're going to confuse this with would be scorp. And this is the scorp, and as you see, no tuft on it, um, and a grey patch on its back. Um, these ones, a handful breed in the UK, but most of them are coming from abroad and generally wintering on estuaries. But they're another one that pops up every now and then. They prefer deeper water, so watch out for them. In the reservoirs, places like Shell Marsh, um, they pop up quite regularly. Another two that are usually uh, on 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 the coast. Um, these are sea ducks. This is this is their preferred um, their preferred habitat. Common scoters and velvet scoters. Really, common scoters can't. Totally unmis unmistakable. They're a large duck and they're black all over. Um, a few breed in Scotland, uh, but around 100,000 winter around the UK. Usually by the coast, but they're another one that get blown in, that come in to avoid the weather. So regularly popping up um, wetlands throughout Shropshire. And usually it cause, cause a bit of excitement when they do. They're, they're, Fabulous thing to see. This is a great crested grebe. 
in its winter plumage. They look quite different. It's a rather unfortunate thing about grebes that they, their winter plumage, they lose all those wonderful tufts and patches they have on their faces and they really look quite dull. But <coughs> obviously the great crested grebe is here year round. Um, but they tend to be a bit more obvious in the winter. Not when they're breeding, they're quite secretive. Um, there was a, a fashion for grebe fur. They have this wonderful fine plumage that was very popular for ladies' hats and tippets and things, um, which many, many of them were shot by Victorians to provide um, feathers for the, for the fashion trade. They declined to only 42 pairs in Britain by 1860. By 1880, they were protected by the Wild Birds Protection Act, which gave them a close season, which meant they couldn't hunt them all year round, which pushed the price of grebe skins up hugely, uh, which meant they hunted more of them. Um, the demand for this really only died out by the early 20th century, but it was one of the moving um, one of the reasons for the Royal Society of Protection of Birds starting up was ladies objecting to this mass slaughter of grebes just to provide hats and tippets. Obviously, as it is in the winter, it wouldn't make a particularly attractive hat or tippet, but the summer plumage, of course, is quite spectacular. And they have that, the, I mean, they have all the head crests and everything. Little grebes aren't so obviously different in the winter. Um, they're absolutely cute little birds. They're, um, they're our smallest grebe and much nearer, the, I mean, they're smaller than moor hens and coots. Little dumpy little things. And they have a sort of powder puff backside, which uh, really it can't be anything else. So it makes them really obvious. Um, the, Bird artist Eric Enyan said about grebes that uh, they were like Queen Anne furniture, splendid in front but not so fine behind. Uh, the local names for little grebe um, reflect its, it, its shape really. In Shropshire they were known as Tom Puddings and um, the Orkney name for them, which I think is wonderful, is Little Footy Arse. Um, they have a loud trilling call that's lovely and an instant rippleless dive they can just disappear underwater completely unseen and they'll hide underwater in in the vegetation really with just their beak po poking out um, so they, they can be very secretive um, they're not migrants but they breed in small sheltered waters and they'll appear on the bigger waters during the winter, so you get a chance to see them. They're, uh, they're quite feisty little things. They can be, they can be a, a match for coots and moorhens. Um, they, they, they can do submarine attacks on them. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but, uh, but, they, but they do. They, they, I think it's just a, a bit of stroppiness. Maybe it, it comes from being very small. Other grebes do pop up in Shropshire. This was a black-necked grebe. Very uncommon, but they, they usually give rise to quite excitement when one appears on, on one of the reservoirs. Um, usually get yeah, maybe about 130 birds come into Britain for the winter, and they like the gravel pits and the reservoirs, the deeper water. And this is a a winter red-necked grebe, which is rather unfortunately dull-looking little thing. Um, great excitement recently when a pied-billed grebe popped up at Chelmarsh and has been, um, as they put it, heavily twitched. Lots of people have been to see it. It's very unusual in this country. Um, so do watch out for your grebes, even though they are duller in the winter. The divers are another one that pop up. They're again mostly a seabird, and any of them can appear on what 
was bodies in Shropshire, um, usually causing great excitement. The first year I was at Ellesmere, I mean, in, in 2013, we had a, a, great, a young Great Northern diver there. Um, these, are, these are absolutely fabulous things in, the, in their breeding plumage, but um, the poor little thing looked rather like knitted porridge in its winter feathers. And it was very popular among the bird watchers, and they'd pop up at the boathouse and they'd say, have you seen the Great Northern Diver? Where is it? And I'd have to say, well, last time I saw it, it was over there, and then it dived. And of course, they can go very long distances underwater, so you don't know where it's going to come up again. Um, absolutely marvellous things. There's one recently at Chelmarsh, so they do come and then just disappear again. They could stay, stay for weeks or just a few days. So always worth watching out for some of these unusual blow-ins, if you like. Um, all sorts of things occur in Shropshire that you'd think, well, you know, you're never going to see one of those in Shropshire, it's completely landlocked, but we've got some good, good water bodies with good numbers of uh, wildfowl on. And finally, it's always worth having a look at the gull roosts. Now, I'm rubbish at gulls. I can't identify gulls very well at all. Um, some of the more obvious ones I can make a reasonable guess at, but um, the, some of the roosts have thousands of birds in them. And this is a, for safety overnight. They all gather and they're on the water overnight so they're safe from any predators. And they'll disperse in the daytime to forage. Gulls are another one that are usually driven in from the coast in bad weather. We have resident ones like the, the black-headed gulls will be here all the time. But particularly in winter, we get these big roosts, get 13, 14 different species of gulls. Interesting, it's quite unusual things. Caspian gulls, Glaucus gulls, Iceland gulls, um, little gull, ring bill gull, all popping up at these big gull, gull roosts. But you don't all have to work to get them. You, should, you need your telescope and looking at every single gull to make sure it's... I mean, some people are really good at them. I'm not. You know, people say, is that a yellow-legged gull? And I mean, when it's on the water, I can't see its legs. I've got no idea. But worthwhile just to see the spectacle of it. It doesn't matter if you can't name them all. It really... Just to see them all there together. And you'll see lines of them flying in from different areas where they've been foraging for the day, coming into these roosts for the evening. Um, absolutely lovely thing to see. So don't just stick with the geese and ducks. Have a look at the gulls as well. You might become an enthusiast. All of these places in Shropshire that provide either a stopover place on migration like a, like a service station or a winter home for these birds really need protecting. The wintering grounds are just as important as the breeding grounds. Obviously, if they've got nowhere to overwinter, they're not going to be in good condition when they go back to breed. So we hope that the work we do in Shropshire to preserve habitats in, in a state that they can support these birds is well worth doing. There's hardly any better spectacle, particularly the you know, dawn and dusk and these flights of, flights of geese are absolutely inspirational. Um, if people like Peter Scott that founded the Wild, uh, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust um, started off as a wildfowler inspired by these great flights of widgeon and geese coming in to the feeding grounds and you can hear the cries of them and you know, it inspired him to give up the wildfowling and started painting them and trying to capture the beauty of it. So go out and have a look, see if you can see some, particularly big flops of widgeon, this sort of thing. It's just a spectacular you can't miss. If you want to help preserve places that all these creatures can safely overwinter and feed themselves up 
and go back to their breeding grounds in a good condition. If you do one thing, think about joining the Shropshire Wildlife Trust, because without members, we can't preserve the habitats these birds need. It's all um, it's what keeps us going is, is, is money from, from memberships and from donations and whatnot. Have a think about it. Um, makes a lovely Christmas present this time of year. We were all thinking about it. And um, can be relatively inexpensive, shall I say. It's three pounds a month minimum for adults only, five pounds a month minimum for the whole family, and um, a great thing to do. So do have a think about it. Thank you very much.